am here with David Rhodes, our um, um, sheriff candidate, but you're running unopposed, so the assumption is you will be the next sheriff, which congratulations, by the way. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I wanted to talk to you about the new criminal justice center that is going to be built. Um, it's my guess that you probably know more about that than almost anyone else. You ran the jail for over in Camp Verde for quite a while. I did, yes, I did. And so you know the situation from the inside and from the out. So can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah, sure. You're right. I, I, I have a very unique perspective because we, we worked, uh, I've worked at the Sheriff's Office for 26 years. So I had been there when, you know, 20 years ago or more, when the county was under a federal mandate because of overcrowding issues and, and you know, different problems with the current Prescott Jail, design issues with the current Prescott Jail. And, and then I uh, became the jail commander after I was the law enforcement uh, commander and mm -hmm. worked in the jail for about four years before I became the chief deputy. And during that time, really during the last 20 years, uh, the need for a new facility, uh, criminal justice facility in the Prescott area has been a, a you know, top five priority or more for the Board of Supervisors for really a number of reasons. Uh, one is because the federal government you know, identified this need, this necessity, uh, all the way back 20 years ago to uh, build another facility here in Prescott and uh, to sort of consolidate the courts in the jail. Uh, in 2008, uh, the Yavapai County Board of Supervisors hired a consultant. Uh, I believe the name of the company was C3, and C3 made a number of recommendations. Uh, again, they concluded that a facility was necessary in the Prescott area. And then again in 2015, uh, the Board of Supervisors hired a consultant named uh, Karen Chin, who came and did an extensive study, and I, I worked on that study with her, providing her information. And she concluded that a new facility was needed uh, in Prescott. And include, uh, she also made some other recommendations around diversion um, and different jail programs to keep the population low. Uh, and so we've been working on those for about the past five years to address the jail population and keep it as low as possible. A lot of times people are concerned that you have what they're calling low-level offenders in, um, in the jail, taking up space that they don't need to take up. Can you talk to us about who's in the, in the jail, how long they're there, um, why they're there, how many of those people should safely be let out? Sure. You know, there's, there's so many uh, variables to that question because of all the criminal justice partners that we work with and, you know, really the separation of powers in the government, which I think is extremely important to recognize, is that the executive branch, which is law enforcement, and the judicial branch have to work together in concert for this flow to sort of happen. Um, and, and policies are set by different uh, parties. And, you know, then the legislative branch, of course, the Board of Supervisors in this case, uh, they work with us to provide the necessary, uh, necessary tools, necessary resources, and, you know, sort of represent the people and tell us what's going on. So it, it's, it's interesting because we, um, we, when we initiated this process in 2015, Karen Chen mentioned this exact thing that you're mentioning now who's in the jail and who should be in the jail and who's safe to let out. Well, we recognized right away that many people were in the jail that were mentally ill and or had substance use issues. And a lot of those people were, um, you know, they were suffering from some type of, uh, you know, issue in their lives and they would come to jail and that just exacerbated the situation. And the first few times that they came, a lot of times they came on very low level offenses like trespassing, like disorderly conduct, like, you know, misdemeanor possession of marijuana or, or things like that, which we didn't really have uh, many of those cases. But those people were in the jail and we started looking at how can we help them be successful on their way out the door because they're getting out and they're going back to the community and if we don't address if the system doesn't address that as a whole 
uh, you know, we know that they're coming back. They're going to reoffend and, and recidivate and continue to commit these low-level crimes until eventually they commit a huge crime and they go to prison. So we started working and created a program called Reach Out. And Reach Out was nothing more than re-entry planning from the county jail level. Uh, screening people, recognizing what their issues were, and then putting a resource, connecting them with the resource as they left the facility in an effort to reduce recidivism, an effort to reduce, uh, you know, among that low-level group, and that reduced jail population. So, we got to this point where we are now, to answer your question, this is the long way around it, but you have every single day in the jail now, 90 to 95% of the people have been charged with a felony. So you have 10 or 5 to 10% of the people that have only been charged with a misdemeanor or what we would consider, you know, a low-level offense. And so that, that um, when we start talking about who's in jail, those are the statistics that have been consistent for the last several years. Now, are the people, the low-level offense people, are they there because they're sentenced there? Or are they usually there because they're waiting um, for the judge to see them or for bond to be set or something about, like that? About 80% of everybody in the county jail, and this is important, the difference between jail and prison. Prison is run by the state, and it's everybody who's been convicted of a crime, predominantly felonies or misdemeanor DUIs, some of them, and sentenced to longer than a year in prison. They go to Arizona Department of Corrections. Everybody else is in the county jail. Now about 80% of the people in the county jail every day are what we call pretrial detainees, which means they have not uh, had their case adjudicated yet and they, they have not been sentenced to anything. So they're being held there on bond um, or other conditions of release. The other 15 to 20% are people that have been sentenced to less than a year of incarceration. Okay. So the people that are there for the pre-trial hearings, they usually, they don't stay very long, do they? Uh, the average length of stay is about 22 days. Okay. And that includes felonies uh, and misdemeanors. The average length of stay of misdemeanors is only is about four days. Okay. And who, do, who makes the decision about how long they stay? Do you as, will you as the sheriff make that decision? No. Uh, the judge makes those determinations. That is a strictly a judicial uh, process. And the county attorney doesn't make that determination either. Ultimately, no. The county attorney makes recommendations as to uh, you know what release conditions should be, but the final decision lies with the judge. Okay. So, how full is the Camp Verde facility right now? Camp Verde right now, they're running about 450 to 500 inmates uh, as the average daily population. However, because of COVID, um, you know, the courts have been shut down, uh, very, very limited. Um, we have not been able to accept uh, misdemeanor bookings. There's a lot of what we call, you know, out of custody uh, sentencings waiting to happen. And it's sort of creating, you know, an out of custody means you're in the process, but you're out on bond, but you know you're going to have to go back to jail. Right. And so, um, you know, it's creating sort of a situation where there could be a, a tremendous spike at some point in the jail population when the system gets moving again. It's sort of like a dam holding back water right mm -hmm. now. Uh, so the facility you're planning to build in Prescott, for one thing, um, right now, the current facility that you have is a holding facility only, is that correct? Yes, it's, uh, we accept some bookings there and we hold people there, inmates there, uh, or in custody people there during the daytime only for court. Okay. And they come right down this hill and they park right here and where everybody's sitting over here and get out and we walk them into this building here at the courthouse. Is that a security hazard? It's a, it's a serious security hazard. Um, you know, you a lot of times you don't know who you have in custody who's been arrested. A lot of them have been charged with very serious crimes. And it's one of the things that we have been concerned about every single day. And we've had issues in the past. 
um, with people right here on the courthouse or going into the court because we just don't have an adequate facility that's, that's safe or secure or efficient. And I think a lot of people uh, are who use the courthouse, who use the plaza, who are in downtown Prescott are ready for that practice to end. Mm -hmm. um, and the current facility is up um, kind of between Gurley and Union Street, right? Yeah, it's right up here uh, between, the, um, it's between the marina and a Larkin and Gurley and Union, yes. And right on the other side, there's houses. That yeah, right, right across, across the street. Right across the street. It's in the middle of a neighborhood, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, Prescott's historic neighborhood. So the new facility would be built out, or will be, we'll talk about that in a second, it'll be built out by the Juvenile Detention Center. Yes, the new facility is going to be built uh, just right there on the same property as the Juvenile Detention Center, yes. And it's going to neighbor the Juvenile Detention Center, the sewage treatment plant, and the dump. Yeah, so so there's the, yes, there's the, there's uh, the, the Humane Society is there, which is a, it's a good location for inmate workers to go help at the, at the Humane Society for sure. Uh -huh. um, you have the old Prescott landfill on one side, the juvenile detention center on the other. You've got the sewage treatment plant sort of on the northwest side. And then the transfer station is just down the way there. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of, uh, there's nothing right directly around it like you have at this facility here which is, uh, you know, we can see it from the, uh, yeah. from the courthouse here. Um, and it's going to have courtrooms built into that facility, is that correct? Yeah, this is one of the efficiencies that, you know, we're looking to create, was that you would be able to have judges and people in custody co-located at the same spot so that these hearings could happen much more quickly. Because as it stands right now, we have to transfer uh, you know, hundreds of inmates a week or a couple hundred inmates a week from the Verde Valley all the way to Prescott, hold them here and bring them down here a little bit at a time, which takes a lot of people to do. Mm -hmm. And if a judge wants to see somebody or if there's the possibility of, you know, a plea agreement or a court hearing or anything like that happening, you have to put in, you know, it takes, uh, uh, they have to put in a transport order and then that takes at least another day or two days to get that person over here. But by having them co-located at the same facility and have a facility that doesn't require so much staff to run it because of the, way, because of the design, then we're going to be able to operate much more efficiently and speed up the criminal justice process. Will you have to hire a lot more people to run this facility here or is it going to be kind of a wash since you're not going to have to drive people back and forth as much? Well, I wouldn't say it's going to be a wash, but it is going to be a much more efficient operation. Right now we have a number of people that are, um, uh, you know, dedicated solely to the transport function. Uh, about 30 officers, I believe, to the court and transport function. And all that they do is move people around the county to courts and whatnot. And so, you know, those detention officers can start working inside that facility uh, when, you know, when we build it. And so we're looking at those efficiencies. We're looking at, um, you know, a number of other ways to, to make it as efficient as possible. And you keep the operational costs as low as possible. And there will be people will be safer because you won't have to be transporting them in and out and on the street and on the plaza and that sort of thing. Much safer. It's just a much more secure operation and you don't have to move people that are in custody that many times in that many places and then have them exposed to the general public here at the courthouse, uh, inside the courthouse, inside the courtrooms, all these things that happen now when that's not a problem anymore. Um, it'll be much more safe, much more efficient. Is and it, the transport costs are about $2 million a year. Yeah. So let's talk about the funding. Um, last summer, I believe, the Board of Supervisors voted to increase property taxes by about 18%. They did. Well, the, the Yavapai County portion of it, I believe, was 18%. Right. Not, not the overall property tax bill. Um, 
does that all go towards the new facility or is that kind of split? Well, this is really a board of supervisors question and so I don't want to speak out of turn, but I do know from what I've been told in the public meetings, that the public's been told, yeah. that a portion of that is going to go to the public safety retirement debt, a portion of it is going to go to the debt service on the new facility, and a portion of it will go to the operational costs of the new facility or other things that the county needs. You know, we need to work through that that budget process now, and that's part of my job. Uh, as the sheriff is to work closely with the board of supervisors and the other criminal justice partners to find you know any efficiencies or abilities to save money and get the job done and make every dollar count uh, that i possibly can and that's something you're concerned about you're not willing you're not like trying to build a taj mahal no 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 and... you know we we want this to be this this you know it needs to exist we need to have it uh, for public safety, we need to have it because you know law enforcement is driving people all the way to Camp Verde. We're doing all this transport. You've got all these inmates down here, but we're trying to make it as operationally uh, efficient as possible and build only what's needed. And that's also going to be helpful to the other law enforcement agencies in this area too. I would oh, think. tremendously! You know the the level of service that we're able to provide with the facility that we have is just very, very low. Mm -hmm. And you know, to, and so a lot of times law enforcement has to go to Camp Verde to take somebody to jail over there if we can't accept them here. We don't have medical staff here. We don't have, you know, a lot of the things that, that would make it a full service jail. We just can't put here because, uh, you know, we don't have the facility for it. Okay, so they voted on the tax increase last summer. Um, and then they voted to build the facility yes. this, what, in January, is that correct? I think they voted to move forward also last summer in August. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, have they received the money from the bond? Uh, yes, I am told that they have, the, the bonds have been issued, uh, the money is in the bank for the county, and, uh, they're, they're moving ahead. Okay, tell me about the restrictions on the bonds. Well, again, this is something that uh, is a board, the supervisors issue, and it's, mm -hmm. they're, they're really the ones that, that can answer the question. However, um, I do know from the public meetings that the bonds have been issued in the jail district. Now, the jail district requires that the only thing that um, you can spend that money on is the actual criminal justice facility, including the courts and the, the detention part of the facility. Um, and so, the, and the money can't be returned for a period of time. I believe it's nine years uh, that there's a call where the county could refinance or could um, pay it off. So, so they have the money to build the facility, and they, if they don't build the facility, they still have to pay for it, I guess, is where they're at. Okay. And it cannot be used to build a park or something like that. It has to go... That's my that's my understanding. Yeah, okay. is that it must be used for this facility. So it's a done deal. Well, uh, you know, I I suppose that anybody could, could or somehow things could change. I don't know, but I think that it would be very difficult to make that change right now because it would mean uh, you know spending millions of taxpayers' money, uh, including the interest on the bonds that have been issued. There's the I, I, the architect costs, which I think are about three or four million dollars, the uh, three or four million dollars that have been paid to the uh, construction management company, uh, all the site prep that has been done, you know, there would be uh, a significant amount of money, I would guess around ten million dollars that will have just been thrown away if the county decides not to build this facility for some reason. Plus the interest they'll be paying. In the Plus debt. the interest that they would be paying. Until the loan could be called. Yep. Okay. So, um, all right. Let's talk about. I, I want to say something yeah. real quick about that. You know, I, I recognize that there are people that are concerned about the facility and the cost and the tax and the location. And, and, and I'm very sympathetic to that. You know, everybody's got their opinions and whatnot. This wasn't something that was decided quickly or overnight or, you know, in the darkness or, you know, in some back room. These were. Uh, many 
public meetings that the board had, study sessions that the board had, the Karen Chin report was a public meeting, everything leading up to this conclusion, including, you know, the location, uh, the city and the county agreed on this 20 years ago. And when they made this swap, and, you know, everything has been leading up to this for a very long time. Um, and, and as much effort as we could at the Sheriff's Office by going to public meetings, by doing different things, uh, putting out, you know, fact sheets, going to all the board meetings, taking questions, talking to the public there to make this a public process and get public input, that was very important and we, we worked very hard at that. The county worked very hard at that. The board did. Okay, so what about, you know, a lot of suggestions have been made for dispersion or, or you know, some sort of a alternate plan besides just keeping people in jail. And I know that you said that since 2015 you've looked at a lot of programs and you've put some in place and talk to us about that. Well, diversion and um, release coordination are two of the most important things going forward for the criminal justice system in my opinion. And it's, a, it's all it really is, it's not that complicated, but you know, if you arrest somebody or somebody's arrested and they're in jail, uh, learning a bit about them and what they're, you know, really what do they have uh, some issues, whether they're mental health issues, whether they're substance use issues, whether they're, um, you know, homeless issues, transportation, employment, income, do they have some things that are going on that led to some behavior that probably led to their incarceration. And if you can do something to connect them with the right resources on their way out the door as they're leaving jail in an effort to reduce recidivism, well then why wouldn't we be doing that? That's exactly what people think that we should be doing. So when we started working on this, the state had a great, um, they had just created a great reentry plan prison transitions program and they were funding it at about 15 million dollars a year and releasing you know a number of people back into uh, uh, you know back through their transition program which is just mm -hmm. reentry planning um, and I you know we have a great uh, reentry uh, uh, coaching uh, volunteer group here that works through Matt Force uh, that took a lot of these people uh, coming in and you know coached them into the community the thing about prison, though, is we looked at, when I was in the jail, as a jail commander, I thought, man, we've got to do some reentry planning here. I walked the halls of the jail every day, and I got to know a lot of the inmates that were there, a lot of people that were there in custody, and I got to know their stories. I got to know how long that they were there. There were, I could tell you stories that just shouldn't have been happening. You know, people that were in jail on a $500 bond for misdemeanor, and they were there for 60 days. Yeah. Uh, these these were not the way that you can uh, you know make meaningful impact in people's lives mm -hmm. to, to which is what the system's supposed to be doing so we created our own um, uh, reentry program at the jail and it's very different than prison and the difference is in prison you know when somebody's getting out so you have 30 60 90 days to sort of make plans for that and you know figure out what's going on and do screenings and find them jobs works so these things but at the county jail a lot of people are getting out in 24 hours or even less sometimes but they were being arrested that was that's the low level offenders that we talked about earlier and they're getting arrested for the very first time but nobody really knows what issue that they have that's driving that behavior and i give you you know we have tons of examples but one of the first ones that I remember was a 19-year-old young man that got booked into the jail on a Friday evening for shoplifting at Walmart. And he goes, he gets out the next day about noon, and nobody knew that he was a heroin addict. Nobody knew that. His chances of recidivism are 100%. We, we missed that opportunity. And that is something that we never wanted to do again. It was miss that opportunity to say, whoa, time out. There's a bigger issue going on here. We need to get you into substance abuse treatment. Now, not after you've committed four or five more offenses. Now. 
so that's when we created Reach Out. And Reach Out was essentially, it worked like this. We took reentry planners and coordinators and we put them in the jail. And we said every single person at the time of their booking, you screen them for, for behavioral health issues, including substance use or other determinants of health. And you connect them with treatment or other resources, including housing, transportation, educate their families, whatever you can do, even if they're getting out the next day. We don't miss anybody. We started this program and we went to the state, to the legislature and to the governor's office and said, look, the counties, you are state, you're spending 15 million a year for reentry planning from the prison. And that reentry planning is you're only taking in about 19,000 people a year and you're releasing about 19,000 people a year. The counties, on the other hand, are taking in about 250,000 people a year and releasing about 230,000. And what we know of re recidivism or reoffending is that 230,000 is the new 19,000 that you're gonna be taking someday. So if you let us, if you support us financially, to build this model here in Yavapai County and it's successful, this should be a statewide model. Re-entry planning at the county jail level. And Governor Ducey said, uh, you know what, you're right. And he signed the bill into law, passed the legislature, signed the bill into law. Yavapai County has been getting, the Sheriff's House has been getting money to do this re-entry planning that we use to hire coordinators at the Sheriff's Office. We also went out and asked NAU to do a study on this on this pilot project and to report out independently on the outcomes and if it's working or not you know because if it is we want to know we want it to not just be us saying that it's working mm -hmm. so NAU and I think I sent you this report um, not too long ago their most recent data shows a recidivism reduction in that population from 38 percent to 16 percent that's been sustained over two years. Mm -hmm. So we're having impact. During that time, the jail population, which was trending up every year, has dropped 10% year over year, and now we're in our third year of that. So we have reduced the jail population by connecting low-level offenders with uh, services. We've, we've reduced the jail population and reduced the trend. Um, without letting people out of jail that uh, shouldn't be let out. And really that's, you know, the point behind this program mm -hmm. is to be, not let people, at the first sign of trouble with the criminal justice system, wrap around and figure out what's going on and connect them to services. The, now, I'm sorry, you asked okay. about the governor's, uh, so the governor, yes. Just uh, the prison transition program was about to expire, or it was set to expire. It needed new funding this year, and uh, because of the uh, because of the crisis with COVID, the legislature they uh, uh, they adjourned early without addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. And on the day it was going to expire, July first, he signed an executive order to extend funding for that program, which signals a commitment, I believe, to you know, what we're seeing going forward in criminal justice reform. We're not talking about sentencing reform and, and letting dangerous criminals out of jail. We're talking about uh, connection to services to reduce recidivism. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really what we're talking about. It's a great step though. It's a fantastic step, you know, it's working. A lot of people, so many people have uh, come together to make this happen. All of our criminal justice partners here in Yavapai County uh, you know, the judges, the county attorney's office, public defender, uh, the board of supervisors, everybody has stepped up to support this because it's what the community expects. Right. So the, and the new criminal justice center will also have some mental health um, facilities there. Yeah, it's going to have a, a, a transitional facility there. And so uh, what that means is that release coordinators will be able to go out of the jail. So. People come in, they get screened. Release coordinators can co can uh, after when they're being released. Now we know we have some information about them. Mm -hmm. They go over to the uh, to the release center, which is the out of custody you know mental health facility, and there 
um, you know, anybody that is involved in their treatment or services beyond that point that doesn't really touch the criminal justice system, they come into that facility. That's where that happens. Okay. That's where those connections occur. So that's not really, that's not going to be part of your responsibilities, but you're making it, you're making it easy to happen. Yeah, it, it has nothing to do with uh, the uh, the jail or anything exactly. Though we're, you know, you're bridging a gap, so to speak. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're working in collaboration, and I think that's been one of the biggest problems with criminal justice and and criminalizing mental illness for years is that you work every all the entities work in silos, all the disciplines work in silos, and you mm -hmm. have to have partnerships. You have to have people that work together. Uh, you know, lay down their ideology, lay down whatever, and recognize that they can do something that could make someone else's job easier, that has an impact for public safety. One of the things I'm hearing, though, as you talk, you're not looking at the jail population as just a bunch of really horrible, terrible, bad, bad people. You're looking at them as human beings. Well, they are human beings, you know, and there are a lot of people in there that have done some stuff that they need to go to prison for and I, I want to make that perfectly clear you know that uh, you know, murderers child molesters um, people you know pornography child pornography a rapist uh, people who burglarize people's homes um, you know serious thieves or you know fraudsters of these people uh, who are very cognizant and aware and intentional or, or whatever, you know, however they got themselves in their situation. They're going to go through the criminal justice system and, you know, if they're found guilty, they need to go to prison. But what we know about recidivism is that a lot of these people uh, started out at the lower level. Mm -hmm. uh, they started out, you know, committing crimes that were just public nuisance crimes or whatever. And that maybe if somebody could have done something to help them, at that point, they wouldn't have became the murderers and the, you know, whatever. They wouldn't have ended up going to prison later. And so that's what it's about. And, you know, I mean, I'm a 27 year law enforcement guy, and, you know, we're, we're not going to tolerate it. This is about public safety. The end result of this, people ask me all the time, why should the police and the sheriff be involved in decriminalizing mental illness isn't that for the courts and and the you know the behavioral health providers or whatever to do and i'm like i said no you know our primary focus in law enforcement number one focus is public safety protection of life and limb and property and if you uh know that you can do something that prevents crime because crime prevention is what law enforcement's all about. If you know you can do something that prevents crime, then you need to do it. And we know that by working with all of our partners and creating a system in which people get their issues addressed early on, impacts public safety. That's why this is a big deal. That's why we're going this direction. Um, and yes, you know, people, I mean, who doesn't, a lot of people, you, you arrest the book, Eight, nine thousand people a year in this county in the jail. Almost everybody knows somebody that's a friend or a family member that's been arrested at one yeah. time or another. Yeah. You know, and and does it mean they're, you know, not your brother, or your sister? Or, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It means uh, in a lot of cat times, it just means they made a mistake. Okay. Anything else you want to add? I would just add that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know. This process, getting to this point, um, is not as if, you know, a lot of work has been put into it. And when I think about public safety, law enforcement, and the future of Yavapai County, we have to have a plan. We have to have a plan moving forward that is going to keep up with the growth demands, keep up with the, uh, the ever-changing times, and give the men and women in this, in this county who need uh, dedicated resources, funding, and support to make public safety a priority, to make it happen, we need to support them in doing that. And this facility is part of the plan, and it has been for a very long time. 
and it's necessary for those reasons whether it was built five years ago today or you know whenever it's necessary and I in my opinion and and I'm not alone in that opinion so that's uh, that's all that I would really say about that is that we you know we've got to keep moving forward you've got to keep up with the infrastructure you have a Pike County's growing um, a lot of people people move here because of the quality of life public safety is a big part of the quality of life and we're gonna keep it that way